On today's episode of the Katie Halper Show, we talk about the GOP's desire to violate the Constitution and get rid of birthright citizenship. And we make a shocking discovery about a major celebrity who we suspect is an anchor baby. Plus, find out which Democrat looked into his soul to determine that he couldn't support the nuclear peace deal with Iran. Then, Jeremy Newberger talks to us about his documentary, Evocateur, the Morton Downey Jr. movie, about the father of trash TV and right-wing personality-based television. You can catch the film when it premieres August 20th on CNN at 9 p.m. And journalist Sarah Jaffe joins us live in studio to talk about black labor organizers and police unions. And check out the Katie Halper Show every Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. on WBAI.org 99.5 FM. Also check us out on iTunes and SoundCloud. Future guests you can look forward to hearing from include comedians Margaret Cho and Julie Goldman, writer Ta-Nehisi Coates, and documentary filmmaker Yoruba Richin, director of The New Black. It's 6 p.m. Stay tuned for the Katie Halper Show. Wednesday, August 19th, and we are here live in the studio at WBAI 99.5 FM or WBAI.org on the internet, on the web. <sighs> Great to be back. Great to be here, as always, with Gabe Pacheco. Yeah, that's me. I'm right here. Gabe Pacheco is right here in the house, as the kids like to say. And of course, on the engineering you just going to go. You, black and white, real... tickling the whatevers. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Maybe you should switch up the instrument. Let's pretend uh, on, the, on, on the engineering saxophone, <laughs> we have Reggie Johnson. What up, Reg? It's good to see you again this week. Hey, Gabe. How are you? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm wow. feeling pretty good. Oh, awesome. Engineering saxophone. Yes. I just like to music. Oh, uh, well, you know what? Whatever. Role. You know what? I'm not, I'm not mad at you. You're not. Really. I'm no not, one's hating I'm anyone not, here. No, no there, one's, it's no only one, love at the show. It's only love. Show. It's only love. All love and all brown eyes yeah. all the time. Right. I right. see. Yeah. Right? In yeah. fact, right. we're gonna, yeah. today we're going to continue our mission, our mission of having, this is kind of a reverse. No blue eyed guests. No, no light eyed guests. No light eyed yeah. guests. Only brown eyes. <laughs> only brown eyed guests. This is like a reverse Nazi aesthetic. Uh, it's rep- it's uh, ocular reparations, if you will. Wow. And I, and I know ocular you will. Ocular yeah. reparations. And we're going to come so full circle, you're not even going to believe it because I'm going to be talking about an ophthalmologist. Wow. You, just hold on to your seats, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So today on our brown-eyed, as usual, brown-eyed theme show, we have joining us later in the show, in the first a- half of the show, Jeremy Newberger, who is going to be talking to us about his film Evocateur, the Mort Downey Jr. movie. Oh. Yeah, which mm-hmm, is about mm-hmm. the pioneer of right-wing trash TV. Loved him. Loved him, whose tor- torch is carried by the likes of Sean Hannity, mm-hmm. Bill O'Reilly, and Glenn Beck, and Rush Limbaugh today. Yeah. Love the tree, hate the fruit. Love the tree, hate the fruit. Well, exactly. he did change later in his life, though, towards the end. Well, sort of. Uh, kind of. He, kind of. He stopped liking cigarettes because well, he got yeah, lung cancer. That's true. Well, uh, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, yeah. And you're, so you'll hear uh, uh, Jeremy join us by phone from California because he's a filmmaker. He's out there, fancy California, Hollywood. And then after you hear the interview, then you get to watch the film Thursday, August 20th on CNN at 9 p.m. That is the television premiere of the film Evocateur. So make sure you watch it. You're going to want to after you hear the interview because he's a, it's a great subject. That's not me bragging about my interview skills. That's me praising the guest and the and the <laughs> film that he made. And then we'll be joined live in studio by Sarah Jaffe, a labor journalist, co-host of the podcast Be Labored, and a Nation Institute fellow. And she's going to be talking to us about labor issues and Black Lives Matter and where they overlap, which is not explored usually. Mm, interesting. Uh, right? I, I, I need to see the synthesis. <laughs> yeah, you're going to. You're, you're, Gabe doesn't believe me. He thinks I'm, I'm hustling, but I'm not. So, guys, it's a weekday. Hump day. Hump day. Hump day. Hump day. It's a hump day. 
it's a weekday. It's a minute. It's the universe. We're on planet Earth, which means, of course, that there's stuff to be said about our man, our man, Mr. T, Mr. T, Mr. DT, the Donald <laughs> the Trump, Donald. TDT, well, the Donald Trump. Oh, what uh, happened with the Donald this time around? What hasn't happened? So much has happened. Um, let's see. He uh, had some very interesting things to say about immigration as is his want. He talked about the birthright citizenship, right? On Meet the Press. So you guys know that citizenship in this country is based on where you're born. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Yep. So, of course, yep. there's this myth that, that the illegals, which are what undocumented people are called by racists, the illegals have anchor babies, as they're called. <laughs> anchor babies are babies that you have to anchor you into the country, right? It's like a touchdown. A like touchdown. you run yes. into the end zone Expl- and exactly. then you spike the baby like a football <laughs> and you're like, what? And then you do an icky shuffle. Yes. To mariachi music. Gabe knows this because he, as a Mexican American, half Mexican American, is that? Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm a Latino. A my, Latino. Of Mexican descent. Of Mexican descent. A Chicano. A Chicano. Chicano. Yeah, stuck here in occupied territory. In occupied territory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's that's, that's the that's deal. That's the deal. I'm just going to copy him. Um, I'm giving voice. I'm giving. Vo- I'm, I don't want to take away your voice right now. I'm just. I'm echoing you. I'm You're being holding a white a space. ally. I'm, ho- I'm letting that's you hold. That's very the space. progressive of you, right? uh, Katie. Right. Very progressive of you. I should give myself Thanks. a white ally prize. Every week, right? <laughs> yeah. Like what a way to challenge white privilege by giving. I'm going to dislocate my shoulder, patting myself on the back. Oh man! Ally, right? Wow! Awesome. <laughs> so let's do this. Let's, let's do talk this. about. Okay. Let's talk let's about, let's talk about anchor, anchor babies and anchor Donald babies. Trump yeah. and his relationship so, to them. Okay, good. So we got a little, a little bit of audio to play for you. This is Chuck Todd asking Donald Trump, "You want to get rid of birthright citizenship, right?" And this is what the Donald said. This is on Meet the Press. You want to get rid of birthright citizenship? You have to get rid of. Yes, you have to. What they're doing? They're having a baby, and all of a sudden, nobody knows you the baby's that, here. You believe you have no choice. that they're trying you to do no this? They're coming here. Okay. When we have some good people, we have some very good people here. We have a lot of really good people. They're illegal. You either have a country or not. We go out and we're going to try and bring them back rapidly, the good ones. What do you do about the DACA order now, where you've had this grant for the DREAM Act, however you want to refer to it, the executive order that that the president that is... That is, uh, the executive order gets uh, rescinded. One good thing you'll about rescind, you'll rescind that one too. One good thing you'll about rescind the Dream Act executive you're order. Have to, DACA. We have to make a whole new set of standards. And when people come in, they have so to come in. You're going to split up like, families. Chuck, you're going to deport children. Chuck, no, no. We're going to keep the families together. We have to keep the families together. But you're going to keep but them together. To but they have to go. What if they have no place to go? <laughs> we will work with them. They have to go. Chuck, that's great. Have- okay, so basically, <laughs> <laughs> let's have a round of applause. Yeah. They have family to go. values. The babies. The, the babies. babies. The babies. They gotta go. They gotta go. We have fun. We have a good time, but we're gonna <laughs> send them back. Yeah. This is how this is his family unification program. It's everyone is together deported. We'll deported work with together. you. Right. We'll, we'll work, work with, with you. you. We got real estate together. We got real estate agents in uh in uh, Juarez. In Juarez. You go on, you wanna go chi- I'll send you to China. I have some friends in China. I love the Chinese. How can I not like them? I sold I sold a China man my building for sixty <laughs> Uh, yeah, Chi- got Chinese he, man. I he think, actually so, yeah. did say China man. He I did, think. right? Yeah, or was that did. Mort? That may have been Mort. Um, Mort Downey Jr. Are you oh, just coming through right, a circle? Right, I'm not right, making that yeah, up. Right, he got right. into trouble. We're going to talk about this no, later no. on the show. Yeah, he right. said China man, and he got fired. And guess who replaced him? Rush Limbaugh, the much less racist Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just kidding. China man is like the most modest, non-racist thing that uh, Limbaugh's ever said. <laughs> In fact, he would, his fans would be disappointed. They'd call him PC, right? If he said China man. Yeah, but. So the thing that's scary about Trump, by the way, and his pl- this is the family values guy, right? Sending everyone to, like meet, to meet their deaths together, sending them back to Central America so they can possibly be killed. Um, family values candidate. What's amazing is that I know what you guys are thinking. Katie, get over this Trump crush that you obviously have. He's fringe. He's wacky. He's not the norm. But the sad thing is that Trump is like a funny vehicle through which we can look at the rest of the GOP because he's not an outlier. Uh, Lindsey Graham and Scott Walker, who also wants to get the nomination, they also are against birthright citizenship. We're going to play a Lindsey Graham bad practice to give citizenship based on birth. We have evidence of people uh, buying tourist visas for the express purpose of coming over here having a child as birth tourism. I don't think that's a good idea, but that's not going to happen. Okay. Birth, did, you, did he just say birth, birth tourism? Yeah, birth, birth tourism. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to go see Disney World. I want to go to Epcot Center. 
uh, oh, maybe go boy. to Bush Gardens and just blow, blow. spike my uh, anchor spike baby, my baby. Spike and do my, my baby. icky shuffle. That's it. And the and wow. the the Tim Tebow move, right? Scott Walker is also for it, but we don't we don't need to play the audio. Oh, okay. Um, because I I just ate a couple hours ago and I can't really <laughs> maintain the you know <laughs> reverse peristalsis will happen soon. <laughs> so uh, now who are the who are the tour package uh, uh, vendors? I don't know. You're I don't know. You, this sounds like a this sounds like a market I want to get into. I mean, it seems like a competition for the le- for the for the less the least egregious. Right, like who's the least hateful? You know? Yeah. Right, that's what we talked about last time, right, with right. the women's issue. So basically right. The, right. the GOP, the, 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 the fight, the battle for the nomination is who is, what they're trying to show off is who hates women the most or who hates immigrants the most, right? right? Well, how about this? How about no one is a citizen at birth? So anyone who has a kid, you're not a citizen until you're 18, and you take a citizenship test that you have to pass. And if you don't pass, boom. Not a citizen, not the immigrants. I'm not sure. But just right. any American citizen. Right. That's the Republican candidate. I'm oh, I see. Okay, I like, let's so, take right. it to the right. furthest extreme. Right. What? Right. Or we could just do a skin color based thing. Maybe. Well, <laughs> I, I, yeah, because my question was going to be: Would they be saying the same thing if they were Canadian? Right. Of course. And and Donald Trump, FYI, hired undocumented Polish uh, workers right. who did not wear hard hats. Uh, and to build one of his Trump things. We'll Wait, get- Alan Thicke is a Canadian, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. His son, Robin, Robin Thicke. Thicke. Anchor baby. Is his anchor baby. No blurred lines there. Mm-hmm. Pretty black and white. Mm-hmm. No, blurred no blurred lines. Yeah. Straight forward. They both got to go back. Okay. They both got to go okay. back. Okay. I, I can yeah. do problems. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good and one. That's a, that's was a my one. Assist. That was we that built was that together. We all did yeah, that. that. We was built really nice. that, that was joke nice. on rock and roll slash hip hop with... <laughs> with with sto- stolen Marvin Gaye. Yes, exactly. Wow, that's right. beautiful. Um, oh yeah. Oh, my God. oh wow. yeah. Basically, the fix. You're on notice. Both Alan and Robin. You're on notice. Alan, you are the 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 tourist, the baby making tourist, and and Robin, you are the anchor baby grown up. This is what happens to anchor babies. They turn into degenerates like Robin Thick. Mm-hmm. Degenerates mm-hmm. plagiarists. Yeah, degenerate plagiarists who grab women's asses when they think that they they're not seen but then it ca- gets captured in a photo's reflection i don't know we'll talk about that in another show okay anyway yeah. i'm gonna give you a chuck date instead of a uh trump date, a chuck date that's a chuck schumer update last week we talked to becky bond about uh new york senator chuck schumer and his attempt to drum up opposition to the iran nuclear deal well one more democratic senator has jumped on board robert menendez of new jersey and he explained his opposition on tuesday in a speech that he delivered in his Garden State, which was nothing if not extremely humble. He said, quote, I have looked into my own soul and my devotion to principle may once again lead me to an unpopular course. But if Iran is to acquire a nuclear bomb, it will not have my name on it. It is for these reasons that I will vote to disapprove the, ag- the agreement and if called upon would vote to override a veto. So Senator Bob Menendez looked into his soul and he to determine that he couldn't support this deal. By the way, this is the same soul that he looked into when he committed bribery and traded political favors for luxury vacations, golf outings, campaign donations, and expensive flights. This is the soul that he turned to when he did that mm-hmm. stuff. I don't know if you guys know this, but he was indicted. It's the first federal bribery charges against a sitting senator in a generation. And he was indicted this year, and he faces a possible sentence of 15 years in prison for each of the eight bribery counts that he has. And that was because of his relationship with the Florida ophthalmologist. He's them. still a senator. He's still senator, but he stepped down from one of his high positions as like uh, head of the foreign commi- Senate Foreign Relations Committee because it was a little awkward because he's being investigated and he was already indicted. But that's the soul. This guy is so principled, Mr. Principal. You know what? I don't care when politicians are corrupt, kind of. It goes with the territory. But I care when they pretend to be principled. Like, why would you want to say that? Yeah, you know, being hypocrisy, you know, that's kind of funny because you're saying being dishonest, you know, if they're going to be dishonest, at least they're honest about dishonesty. Yeah. And now this time around his so-called morals, right? His moral sense sense, and he's speaking from the heart. Right. And it sounds I think he actually just did Obama and all the people who support the nuclear deal a favor because they're like. The people who are looking into their souls to decide to oppose this deal are people whose souls also tell them to commit bribery. 
Totally. <laughs> right? So that's great. Thank you, Bob Menendez. We want to thank right. you for opposing All the deal. Right. Anyway, um, don't go away. This is the Katie Halper Show. We're here every Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. We have a great show coming up for you. We're going to bring on our, our first guest. We're so excited to have him, Jeremy Newberger, call in. He's going to be talking about his film, uh, Avocateur, the Morton Downey Jr. movie. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick musical break, and we're actually going to play you a song by Mort Downey Jr. You probably know him as a talk show host, but he also had a musical career. So don't go anywhere. This is the Katie Halper Show on WBAI 99.5 FM. I tried to resist the strange attraction To a girl so much younger than me But I could see you felt the same reaction We came face to face with destiny Oh, green-eyed girl, I ain't got much to give you Just a highway that winds all over the world And we'll have our share of stones But you'll be safe and warm Right here in my arms, green-eyed girl and welcome back to the Katie Halper Show. We're here every Wednesday on WBAI 99.5 FM, That's WBAI.org right. on the web. Mm-hmm. And I'm here with Reggie Johnson, Gabe Pacheco. That, by the way, was a song by Morton Downey Jr. called Green Eyed Girl from 1981, which may or may not be the year I was born. We <laughs> played that, play that song <laughs> even though it's not the right eye color, but we're going to let that slide for now. Uh, you can check out the Katie Halper Show every Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. We're so excited to have our first guest with us who made a film about Morton Downey Jr. Jeremy Newberger, are you there? I am here. Hello, Jeremy how Newberger. You? Good, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us. You're in California, sunny California? I am. I'm somewhere, you know, near Mountain View, California. Love it. We're jealous. We're we're very we're near River View, Hudson View, uh Brooklyn. Not even. Not even. <laughs> so Jeremy yeah. Newberger is one of the directors of Avocateur, the Morton Downey Jr. movie. He's the CEO of Ironbound Films and he's produced and directed several feature documentaries, including the two thousand and eight Sundance and PBS hit The Linguists and the two thousand and ten PBS hit The New Recruits both of which were nominated for Emmys. With cult filmmaker Lloyd Kaufman, Jeremy also wrote the upcoming film The Toxic Avenger Part 5. You can catch the television premiere of his latest documentary, Avocateur, the Morton Downey Jr. movie, on Thursday at 9 p.m. on CNN. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, Katie. It's so good to be on your show. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. Um, Can you explain to listeners a little bit about who Morton Downey Jr. is and why you decided to make a movie about him and his uh, show, The Morton Downey Jr. Show? Of course. I I grew up in Long Island, New York. I was born and raised in Dix Hills, and uh, I was about 14 years old around 1987 when The Morton Downey Jr. Show hit the air. And as like a a typical 14-year-old Living in Long Island, I was, you know, smoking cigarettes, was rebelling against the parents, hanging out at the mall, and watching lots of WWF wrestling at the time. And Morton Downey Jr. came on at 11 p.m., and all of a sudden, it was like you were watching something you'd never seen before. It was this chain-smoking, cranky, angry, uh, hostile guy picking fights with people in this, like, low-budget, community television-looking set, and the audience backed up the guy like, you know, the a crazy mosh pit. They were just... It was just a show filled with maniacs. Right. And he would bring politicians on. He would bring, like, counterculture figures. Uh, you know, you'd see a lot of, like, like, guardian angels would be there. And it would always inevitably end with brawls. And... You know, I watched the show for about two years, and then I just forgot about it. <laughs> and I forgot about it until about 2008. Sorry, I'm skipping around my life. No, it's good. And in 2008, my partners Dan and Seth and I were filmmakers. We've made a couple films together, as you just described. We were looking for a new project, and we had a, an epiphany that the three of us all watched that show. Were they also from Long Island or New Jersey or something? 
So Dan and Seth, my two partners, grew up in New Jersey. There you go. Okay. And when the show kicked off in 87, it was like the, you know, the tri-state area. So right. New York, Long Islanders, New Jerseyers, some Connecticut folks, we were all hip to the jive, so to speak. Right. And then, you know, several months later, it, it went national because the, the show just sort of blew up really quick. Right. And uh, I actually didn't know who he was before I saw this movie. Gabe and Reggie, did you did, though, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I'm... we that was one of the family watching really? moments. Yeah. Interesting. It was it was it was surreal. Right. It was very surreal. I, I loved it. I loved yeah. watching. I mean, it was like uh, I, I was probably 11 or, uh, or when I first discovered it. And it was the first time I'd seen something so like iconoclastic on television. Mm-hmm. It felt really punk rock. Uh, it also felt like I used to watch Glorious Ladies of Wrestling. And I used to yeah, watch, low. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I used to the watch. Bombers. Yeah, like like I used to love Ric Flair. And uh, uh-huh. Morton Downey Jr. just came out and was was that guy. He was just like a com- – he might as well have been – he felt like a wrestling manager. Totally, totally. And the way that he right. baited the crowd and the way that um, he just spoke – I don't want to say truth to power, but there were all these people who were seen as serious and all of these issues he and topics. He was bombastic. Right, and he, yeah. he definitely yeah. presented himself as speaking truth to power, right, whether or not he was actually – Taking on the right, he kind of does it in the same way that a white male straight comedian does. Takes on like speaks truth to power or makes jokes like a like Dennis that. Leary, yeah, or right. Dennis Miller, yeah, right. That's that's right. Cool. like pretend like pseudo like he's a populist, right? So can, we're yeah. Jeremy. We just want to. I just want to play two short clips so our listeners get a sense of who um, Mort Downey Jr. was. And sure. can you set help us set these up? The first clip features. Um, is is from a show that Al Sharpton was on. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember that. One. So Al Sharpton, I remember this. Who you know, he, he in appearance and in sort of personality was a very different cat yes, back then. Very different. He cat. was, you know, he had his his hair in that sort of James Brown <laughs> pompadour. Yep. Right. He was wearing big medallions right. around mm-hmm. his neck. Running he, suits. You know, he had the, the cool you know slick suits. Right. And he was. I think making his bones on the Morton Downey Jr. show, and he was on all the time. He was one of the more frequent guests. Yeah. Right, and he was and this usually, was his more full figured uh, oh, phase, yeah. right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah he, he was a big boy back then. Yeah, and the the big news story that had broke during the years of the Morton Downey Jr. show was the Tawana Brawley case. Right. And if your audience is unfamiliar with it, that's like a fun Wikipedia read. But it was a young. African American girl from Wappinger Falls who said that she was raped by four raped and kidnapped by four white uh, four white guys up there. One was an assistant DA, another was a detective. You know, uh, it, it was this huge story, and Al Sharpton ran, uh, dare I say, leapt in the air like the right. Bionic Man to her defense. This was one of the many Morton Downey Jr. shows where he was. Defending Tawana Brawley. It is amazing to me that you could do Morton Downey's show and call something I do a circus. I, I agree. agree. You always what, have to have a What I'm bringing out is the case. The okay. Bottom line, the case is getting it. Wait a minute. You had a We're coming back to the Tawana Brawley case. Stay with us. I'll bring Tawana. I'll bring Tawana. Zip it and tell me what day. I want him here tomorrow. Zip it. That was one of Morton Downey Jr.'s signature lines. He was defending Tawana Brawley uh, with, you know, his two cohorts. I think it was uh, Maddox and Mason were, you know, two attorneys that uh, they were the sort of trio that had taken on Tawana Brawley's defense. And it turned out, and, just so listeners know, it turned out that she made it up. She had made it up. Right. So okay. that was that was the thing. The story was, had, was filled with holes. And eventually it was discovered that it was a hoax. And Al Sharpton never owned up to the hoax right. to this day. Right. And so he lost a lot of credibility. And I mean, you could argue that he's regained it by becoming a much more serious figure who's uh, taken on police brutality and 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 racism and has his show on MSNBC, although he also takes money from very sketchy people. Although maybe there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you're not giving it to sketchy people. Anyway, so um, but but another great clip that you show in the movie, which we don't have a, a, the audio of, is when um, uh, Roy Innes 
Roy or Ron? Roy. Roy Ennis, Roy. who's Roy. from CORE, Council on Racial Equality, big civil rights organization, but now is with a libert- then turned into a libertarian mm-hmm. and an NRA guy and also an Alan Keyes fan. Mm-hmm. He literally <laughs> knocks Al Sharpton over. They're fighting about uh, Tawana Brawley, and he knocks, her, he knocks him over. And Al, Al Sharpton, in this kind of adorable... Um, uh, Pillsbury Doughboy uh, mode falls over, and he he looks really adorable. I just wanted to squeeze him anyway. <laughs> but um, we yeah. have one more clip that we want to play, and this is of um, this is from Ron Paul's appearance on the Morton Downey Jr. show. Do you believe that the government should stay out of our personal business altogether? Yeah, this well, is correct. My... Matter of fact, this is... All right. That's good, guys. But, it also happens more... to be my personal business if I want to kill my four-year-old kid, right? No, 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 wait a minute, wait, you're Why? giving, you're giving libertarian a distorted, uh, explanation. No, no, I'll and stick freedom. to the issues, Listen, pal. Mr. Potato the issue is I had a slime, <laughs> like you in the White House, I'd puke on you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who's for prohibition of alcohol? <laughs> Who's for prohibition of alcohol? Listen, I asked that question. Three people. We get high on the ideas you of freedom. We get high because freedom. So that's. So that's uh, Ron uh, Ron Paul appearing on the Morton Downey Jr. show. And Did you hear the woman that was sort of screeching in that clip? Do you know who that is? No, who? That's Lisa Evers. She's on Channel 5. Oh, my God. Oh my God. The one right. who calls him Mr. Potato Head? Listen, Mr. Yeah, Potato Head? Was, uh, Curtis Slee was... Lisa uh, Slee was right. Curtis Slee was ex-wife. Right, right, right. She used to come on the show all the time in her Guardian Angels outfit with That's Curtis. Right. Oh, my God. So sexy. And now she's, you know, she's like a respected Channel 5 reporter. You see right. her all the time. Right. So, so d- yeah, a tell- couple of hidden gems in the film. You'll find people that completely reinvented themselves right. back then. That's true. Uh, Maybe fact, two of, like, the, the producers of the Morton Downey Jr. show went on to produce Ellen. <laughs> oh, my God. Really? That's hilarious. <laughs> Well, yeah, right? That's not wow. like a connection you would normally make. No, not at all. But it kind of is it's interesting because it speaks to the the kind of overarching theme of Morton Downey Jr., from what I can tell and from what I gathered from the film, which is that his ideology wasn't that important. It was his ratings and his popularity and his personality. He started out as a Democrat. His father was this famous Irish tenor Democrat, mm-hmm. and then he turned into a pro quote-unquote pro-life, I'll say anti-choice guy, Um but it se- he, there seems something very Ann Coulterish about him, like or Glenn Beckish about him. It's not clear whether or not the politics and ideology really matter to him. You know, to say that his father was, you know, a Democrat. His father was like best friends with Joe Kennedy, right? The you know the patriarch of the Kennedy clan. Right. They had houses just across the street from each other, you know, up in Cape Cod area, and they were very very close. He grew up knowing Ted Kennedy and. Jack Kennedy and, you know, the whole clan. Right. And, you know, his father, as you mentioned, was this famous recording star, one of the first huge recording stars in, in the country. And his mother and his aunts were all famous actresses. So he is kind of like, you know, a child, uh, a star, you know, a, a child of famous people who's desperate to follow in the family footsteps. So he started off his career trying to become a singer. And it just didn't, he didn't have the chops that his father had. So he was sort of failing at that. Mm -hmm. And he reinvented himself as a, you know, conservative mouth and started becoming popular on radio and, you know, guest appearing on television shows that, you know, talk politics until he was plucked, you know, by the creators of MTV and put on this show. Uh, to be this guy who yells at people and, you know, causes fights and screams. And so he, he was constructed by, you know, producers. And people we spoke to in the film, you know, suggest that if he had been told, we'll hire you to be a screaming Democrat, he would have done that. Right, right. And he's, I mean, he's, he blows smoke into people's faces, literally, right? He did that. Yes. Then there's footage of him, like, bumping into a, a, a stripper. I don't uh, know how to describe stripper, that. A stripper yeah. from a stripper of God. What's that? I didn't realize she well, was that. Yeah, she she believes that God above has given her you know specific commands to strip, oh. and uh, she came on the show that day to preach her gospel and was uh, essentially assaulted, <laughs> assaulted and you know belittled. It was like the worst day of her life. I mean, we went to her house. She lives somewhere near Binghamton. She's a lovely lady. She still uh, 
she still dabbled in the God stripping, and okay. you know she told us her story very you know clearly, not like a maniac. And you know she was it was not a great day. She went to the show to you know represent uh, women sex workers, and he unleashed like fury on her, like you know. You you don't expect to see someone treat a woman like that on right, TV, right. and yeah, he's talking about having, an audience cheering. Right, right. So, um, anything that you can tell us about uh, his what happened to him? I don't want to spoil it for for the audience, but what would you say? What are the kind of the takeaways from what happened to him? Uh, Morton Downey Jr.'s kind of demise, uh, and clearly there was a demise. It's not, I'm not spoiling anything, right. you know, considering many of you may not have ever heard of him. Uh, it's like really symbol it's a symbol of kind of what happens when uh people take this kind of crazy act onto the radio or tv and they can't maintain it mm -hmm. forever and morton downey you know when the advertisers start pulling out uh the ratings start going down uh people will do anything to sort of maintain that kind of act and unfortunately for Morton Downey, he took things a little too far. Right. So you see the film, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking right. about. And uh, what you had access to his daughter. You spoke to his daughter? Yeah, you know, he had four wives, and right. we spoke to one of his daughters from his uh, third wife. And she was a college-age girl when the show was on. So she was living with him and his third wife, uh, you know, in Jersey while he was doing the show. Uh, I'm sorry, she was a daughter of his second, second wife. Right, she right. lived with him in his third it's hard wife. It's to keep track. Her name was families. Kelly. Right. Uh, and you know what? She was terrific. She, she, I mean, she loved her father, but she, she kind of told it like it was. Right. She saw how he was behaving, how it was different than, you know, the dad that she loved and knew was, you know, this great guy. And it scared her a little. Right. Yeah, there, and there seemed to be a lot of psych interesting psychology going on in terms of his relationship with his father. As the film explains, he was, he had a very traumatic childhood because his father won custody of the kids and wouldn't let his wife see him, see the kids. Yeah. Is that true? Wow. Yeah, he pretty much grew up without a mom. Right. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. Where can we find you online? Um, I'm Jeremy Newberger on Twitter if you want to interact with me and Certainly, if you watch my films, you'll see me, you know, tweeting about it during right. it. And, uh, and that's 9 at 9 p.m. 9 p.m. on CNN Thursday. And what else, what are you working on? What are your upcoming projects? Um, you know, a cool project that I'm working on, which probably will surface sometime in November, it's a film called The Anthropologist, and it sort of tracks how communities – uh, sort of indigenous communities are dealing with climate change. Oh, wow. It's a real de that sounds departure fascinating. from Morton Downey Jr. I, I like to, you know, pick topics that are really different from yeah. each other. Great. Well, we'll have to have you back on to talk about that. And we are going to play something I think you'll enjoy, Jeremy, because lots of people have said how Mort Downey Jr. was kind of the forefather of this trashy right-wing television. And some of the people that he's inspired are Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh, but also Bill O'Reilly. And I want to play a clip that is, I'm not making this up. Early on in the show, I wanted to have this um, segment called Right Wing Erotica. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a little right wing erotica, uh, a little gem, a little treat of right wing erotica that just relates beautifully to what we're talking about. Because this is actually Bill O'Reilly reading. I'm not making this up. This is him reading. It's an audio book uh, from his book. Those who trespass. There's no bad language, so we don't have to beep anything out. But it is very suggestive. So that's going to be our musical break, and I and uh, I hope you enjoy it, Jeremy, and the listeners I'm out sure there. I'm sure I will. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Say, baby, put down that pipe and get my pipe up. I would like you to unhook your bra and let it slide down your arms. You can keep your shirt on. Cup your hands under your breasts and hold them for ten seconds off with those pants he then dropped to the floor kneeling before ashley pushing her skirt up to her waist using a fair amount of pressure he kissed her inner thighs using his lips and tongue his hands reached the waistband of her hose shannon gently gave a tug and ashley lifted her hips he slipped the hose down to her ankles all the while continuing to knead her skin with his tongue Ashley climaxed twice before the two got up from the couch and climbed the stairs to the master bedroom. She obediently performed oral sex on him. 
Five feet away, the other teenage girl sat on a mattress on the floor and watched, greedily sucking on a crack pipe Robo had passed to her. Edgar looked over and grinned, showing yellow, decaying teeth. Obviously, he preferred oral sex to oral hygiene. Closing her eyes, she concentrated on the tingling sensation of water flowing against her body. Suddenly, another sensation intruded. Ashley felt two large hands wrap themselves around her breasts and hot breath on the back of her neck. She opened her eyes wide and giggled. I thought you drowned out there, snorkel man. Tommy O'Malley was naked and at attention. Drowning is not an option, he said, unless, of course, you beg me to perform unnatural acts right here in this shower. And that was, I'm not making that up, that was Bill O'Reilly reading from Those Who Trespass, which is uh, a mystery that he wrote in 1998. I'm not making this up. I can give you the ISBN number. It's 0767913817 if you want to look it up. Um, And it's about uh, the revenge uh, television journalist exacts on network staff after disputes very similar to O'Reilly's real tensions with CBS. And the revenge takes the form of a series of graphically described murders. And there's lots of sexy time scenes in it. Um, and what a better transition mm. than to introduce mm. our next mm. guest. Mm. Uh, great se- segue. Great segue, right? Sarah Jaffe is here joining us live in studio. They use uh, that as a form of torture in Gitmo, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and the Kid Rock, right? I think I'm traumatized now. I, know. I don't know if I, I can. I didn't give a trigger warning. <laughs> I'm sorry. No I'm safe word. I, there there I, should I, have right. been a safe they word. They handed me these headphones and I'm like, what on earth is happening I here? Know. Well, Goodness. yeah, unfortunately, we should have given you earplugs to put in before the headphones. But I am so damaged. I know. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, everyone, I'm I, gonna, when I, I make this a podcast, I'm going to make sure to put oh, a trigger Oh, God, warning, I'm so but damaged. The damage is done with the live God, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Gabe's fine, though, right? I know. I feel like I'm going to run out and get that book yeah, like, as soon as the show's done. Yeah, Gabe, Gabe the table is lifting You're on Gabe's side of the You're On vicious. my Kindle, making yeah. it happen. <laughs> He's going to make it happen on his Kindle. Um, Sarah, thank you for Hi. joining us. Welcome back. You've been on uh, the morning show on I WBAI, have. but this is your debut on the Katie Halper Show. This is. This is my first time in this studio since oh, yeah. WBAI has been in this spot. Yes. Well, welcome. Thanks. And um, Sarah is a very prolific, prestigious labor journalist <laughs> who's been writing about labor before it was cool, I believe, is in your Twitter bio, it and is. I will co-sign for that reasons. statement. For <laughs> um, and Sarah's here to talk to us about a, uh, a recent article she wrote for Truth Out. And Sarah's also a fellow at the Nation Institute. And you can find her writing all over the internets. and all over the internets. All over the internets, right? And, on the, and she has a podcast. I do. Which um, I just came from recording. How was that? It was very good. Awesome. Um, and this article that you wrote in Truth Out is called Black Labor Organizers Urge AFL-CIO to Reexamine Its Ties to the Police. So can you tell us about what you, um, what you discovered while writing this? Yeah. So the piece came out of um, a call from a, the Union of Graduate Student Employees at the University of California system. And so within that union, which is within the United Auto Workers, um, a group of mostly black student organizers decided that they wanted to have a presence within that space as black organizers, um, inspired by, of course, the movement for black lives and by their own experiences organizing in that space. So they formed the Black Interest Coordinating Committee, and they wanted to, in addition to, you know, taking part in this debate within their union, to actually affect the debate that's going on around the country around the role of police, the impunity that police usually operate under, and in particular, the role of police unions and all of that. And so what they did was they put forward a resolution, which the entire um, local of the union actually voted for, to ask the AFL-CIO to disaffiliate from the one police union that is actually affiliated with the AFL-CIO in the first place. It's important to note that most police unions stand on their own anyway. They're not part of the AFL-CIO, and they certainly do not operate with anything that we would most of the time understand as labor solidarity. So, yeah, so this, um, this particular local put forward this resolution, and... So far, at least as far as I know, they have not gotten a response from the AFL-CIO and, of course, the IUPA, the police union in question, sort of dismissed their calls. Okay. So this is interesting, right? Because you have this kind of clash of, like you said, these two cultures. There's labor solidarity and then there's the police union movement. And usually when we read about them, they're releasing statements about how um, 
Eric Garner was died right. because of his health issues, right? right. It's like not the right. prog- I mean, I was going to say it's not the progressive labor voice we're used to hearing, but that's kind of the the labor voice is so varied, right? Yeah. Well, it's it's one of the points that I make in the piece is that like in some ways the problem with police unions is is not too dissimilar from like the worst things that other unions have done over their history, which is basically really short-sighted, self-interested bargaining that is only for the immediate benefit of their existing membership rather than actually thinking about the working class. And what's interesting about this call that um, that this union made, right, is that it's actually like a very intentionally sort of anti-capitalist document, right? It's talking about the working class and the struggle of the working class and how the police are, at bottom, antithetical to the struggle of the working class. And they are actually a tool of the ruling class to in that class struggle, right? And so that in itself is kind of a challenge to how the the mainstream labor movement operates, right? The mainstream labor movement is mostly politically connected to the Democratic Party. It is mostly concerned with reforms. And though there are plenty of people in the labor movement who are certainly anti-capitalist of one stripe or another, that's not really... You know, we don't hear a lot about the the class struggle in that kind of terminology from, you know, most unions in the AFL-CIO. Right. That's something that if you tra- travel to Europe, I often encounter, or you meet Europeans, they, they're kind of surprised by how um, depoliticized the labor movement in this country is in, in many ways. Well, and... and- or maybe it's in a more different right. Way. Maybe it's actually yeah, more it's political, really, right? It's, right. It's it's um, yeah, and it's a question. I actually have a piece coming out in the Progressive magazine um on a totally different subject, or, or actually on a very related subject of how the labor movement exercises political power. That actually looks at some of those questions of like whether being tied to the Democratic Party or operating within the Democratic Party is the best way to do this, and how that works. So that's a whole other thing that we can talk about for three hours right but with the police unions the other thing is that the problem with the police isn't that they have unions right the problem with the police is that they're police and that they're like given (laughs) impunity not by their union i mean their union certainly negotiates for it but they're given all that power by the state Right. right so like when the police unions here in new york to go back to an example that most of your listeners probably know about um earlier this year through kind of a massive temper tantrum over bill de blasio saying some like vaguely critical things about them um and had what appeared to possibly be a work slowdown um i mean we know they turn their backs on de blasio right. at the police officer's funeral right. they also may have been engaging in a form of a work stoppage right. which is technically illegal because what what a, what a way to not Poli- they didn't want Bill de Blasio to politicize the deaths. Yeah. So well, they what they do is they turn their backs on right. them. I mean And so right. So what we saw them do there was um well, they won. I mean, really, right? Like Bill de Blasio has basically caved mm. into them yeah. since then and has, if anything, like the policing of protests and things has gotten more vicious and more intense. And I cannot speak for what it's like to be a person of color on the streets of New York right now, but I imagine that the police are not a lot of fun to deal with right. still. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was a, a really good example of sort of the police unions exercising that kind of power um, against their the leadership of the city, right? The elected leadership of the right. city who ran on this platform of police reform to prevent some of those changes taking place. And so, I mean, it is a good example of, of police unions sort of being regressive. Right. Um, and yet, like, we did this interview with um, Josh Freeman, who is a historian at right. the City University of New York, um, about this. And he was like, you know, it's interesting because, like, in this place also, the police unions were doing a thing that, like, most people argue the labor movement should do more of, which is, like, using job actions to mm. win things. Um, and that they're very militant. They have a lot of internal solidarity. They just don't have a lot of broader solidarity with the rest of the labor movement. Right. So was there any was there any discussion about how instead of dissociating or deaffiliating mm-hmm. from this they should actually try to kind of influence the police union through their I mean, AFL-CIO or is that yeah so part of part of what the conversation that I had with Brandon Buchanan who is one of the organizers um, within the Black Interest Coordinating Committee was that you know this was this call for the AFL-CIO to disaffiliate is also a call for the IUPA 
to think about how it operates and to think about what side it's on. And so in that way, this is is a much more interesting call to me than sort of external calls to like bust police unions, right? right? Because right. that really easily lends itself to the same sort of, you know, anti-public sector worker rhetoric that we hear from people like Scott Walker and John Kasich, right? right. Or Chris Christie. Um, Big Black Lives Matter. Or Rahm Emanuel, activists. but that's another story. Right. Um, right. And so... What's actually more interesting here is this is people from within the labor movement who are like, yes, you are allowed to have a union. We are not trying to take away your right to organize. We're trying to say that the institution you're part of and the institution you're often defending is racist, right. is violent, Classist. is right, is a tool of people who are not on our side. It's like the overseers union. Right. Exactly. And like, I, and you know, the police as we know them grew out of slave patrols like this is not even right this isn't can you, you know, can you, it's can not you a, elaborate on that for our listeners yeah so the um i actually know this from from radley belko's book the rise of the warrior cop among other places but yeah so the institution of policing as sort of a, a quote public service job grew out of these <laughs> in, especially in the south in this country right the first institutionalized groups of people whose job was to keep other people in line were slave patrols whose Mm -hmm. job was to hunt down runaway slaves um and so obviously the job has changed a lot since then and yet also in some strange ways not changed that much now it's parking tickets too yes (laughs) now it's parking tickets too and and right but right so this is this is an institution that in a lot of ways has this history that goes way back of existing to control black bodies Right. right And why is this one particular police union part of the AFL-CIO when other ones aren't? That is a good question that you would have to ask them. Okay. Um, And they they occasionally threaten to leave whenever the, you know, well, when like Rich Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO, went to Ferguson um, almost a year ago now um, and, you know, spoke with people and put out a, a fairly strong statement saying that, you know, the police in this country often act as tools of the oppressor, in essence. Um, And this same police union sort of threw a tantrum and accused Rich Trump of having an agenda and speaking without knowing what he was talking about and all of this stuff. So, I mean, yeah, there's always the question of whether they'll just take off on their own anyway. Right. Um, Because, yeah, most of the police unions um, sort of proudly stand alone. And there's a long history, too, of things like security guard people like security guards not being allowed to be in collective bargaining units with other workers anyway. So Hmm. there's there's a structural difference um, in any case. But, yeah, so the fact that this one union is part of the AFL-CIO in some ways makes it the weird one. Right. So on the front page of the New York Times there's today, there's an article about Samuel Harrell, who mm-hmm. was an inmate um, who was a history of mental illness, and he was basically beaten to death yeah. in a uh, at a fish kill correctional facility. Right. And they said that it was because he overdosed on some synthetic marijuana. God, the um, synthetic marijuana. Thing. Yeah, the, the kind that what that it, what is Bratton bruises. calling it like the weaponized marijuana or something? Yeah. So apparently it's so weaponized that it can beat you up. Yeah, it leaves marks on you That's and impressive. it throws you down the stairs and it causes uh, police to jump on you while you're lying down in handcuffs. Man, you should stay away from that. Stuff. Um. So and there were like tons. So what happened is that they're they're looking into this because so many in, fellow inmates. Yeah. witnessed this and they gave so many accounts that were like strikingly similar mm-hmm. right you see right. things from different perspectives there's always going to be kind of some kind of deviation right. from the yeah. the standard narrative or whatever but it's overwhelmingly consistent and yeah. uh I, it was interesting because james miller mm-hmm. who's a spokesman for the correctional corrections officers union yeah. um gave a statement about uh about this investigation and said in an email that they were reviewing all the facts before rushing to judgment. And then he he, also, he said, rather than, I don't know if he has his accent, but I'm going to assume, rather than simply relying on allegations made by a handful of violent convicted felons, we will continue to work with our partners in law enforcement yeah. to ensure resolution to this tragic incident. Which is just, what struck me is how incorrigible and shameless and brazen he is. Yeah. Like, and it's this culture of impunity. Yeah. There, he's not, there's no tone of, of, uh, like no remorse at all yeah. there's no he's not at all contrite right they did nothing wrong and he goes on to within his defensive statement 
offend the violent convicted felons who right. are abused by the violent officers who are not convicted felons but should be convicted felons well, right well and and one of the things that we have to sort of think about in terms of thinking about police officers or uh, correctional officers unions right is that like the upstate new york economy essentially runs on prisons right. at this point like you can't actually change this system without coming up with an entirely new way to give a whole lot of people jobs right. mm-hmm. and so this is just a like Again, I mean, we can talk about correction officers. We can talk about all sorts of different unions that have different issues. But, like, the fact remains that those are people who don't really have other jobs. Right. There isn't really anything. And so there has been this system that's been created by disinvestment from all of the jobs that used to exist in upstate New York. You know, things like General Electric um, that no longer make anything here. And the people who used to have those jobs are now... Prison guards. Prison. Right. right, exactly. Right. And what does that do to people? Well, Sarah, you're going to have to come back and we're going to have to map out a plan to solve this problem. It may take a couple of episodes of the show. <laughs> Where can we find you online? You can find me on Twitter at Sarah L. Jaffe, Sarah with an H, and you can find my website at adifferentclass.com. Great. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Reggie Johnson. Thanks, Gabe Pacheco. This is the Katie Halper Show. You can catch us every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on WBAI on 99.5 FM. WBAI.org, online, on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Tumblr. Have a great week, and we will see you next week. And we're going to have Yoruba Richin, the director of The New Black, and Julie Goldman on. See you. Bye.